Hello and welcome. Happy Friday. So excited that you're here. Today is another episode of the Nonprofit Show, and it is our final uh, episode of the Power Week that we have here with Kyle Hendrickson of Ide Bailey. Each and every Friday, we dedicate these episodes to our Ask and Answer episodes. Thank you so much to Fundraising Academy at National University for being our exclusive sponsor of Every Friday. And again, we've had Kyle Hendrickson with us, Director of Cybersecurity at I Bailey. He's joining us from North Dakota, but I Bailey works across the nation, so many satellite offices uh, throughout our country. And, and so just so glad to have had you here here each and every day this week for the Power Week. Not quite sure what we're going to do tomorrow, although we know you're pouring concrete, um, but without, you know, showing up each and every day, our coffee in hand and uh, you here for conversation, it's not going to feel the same. So Kyle Hendrickson, Director of Cybersecurity at Ide Bailey, again, joins us today for our Ask and Answer episode that closes up every weekday. Hey, we want to give a shout out to our presenting sponsors. Those of you that are uh, watching, you can see the logo right on screen. Those of you that are listening, I want to say thank you so very much to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. These companies have kept these episodes growing and growing and growing. And if you haven't checked them out, do yourself a favor and do check them out online. But a friendly reminder, wait for about uh, 28 minutes to check them out because you don't want to miss what Kyle's going to share. If you want to share any previous episodes or perhaps today's episode really grabs your attention, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. So all of our um, episodes, they are online. You can find the archive as well as podcasts. So wherever you stream your podcast, you can find us there too. You can put us in your ears and just listen to us as you walk. Um, so check us out on podcast form. So Kyle, I mentioned uh, every Friday we do questions, ask and answer. They come in from our audience across the nation, in fact, across the globe. And because we have focused with you this week on cybersecurity, guess what? These questions are all about cybersecurity, which is a good thing because you're here and you're able to answer them. I'm still learning, but I have already learned so much from you. So again, thrilled to have you here. I'm going to read the question aloud for our viewers and our listeners, and Kyle's going to be on the hot seat. So you ready, my friend? I'm ready. <laughs> ready as you'll ever be. I like yeah, it. I'm in. So Evan in Portland, Oregon, uh, submitted this to us. If we need to cut some corners and maybe look at reducing our insurance costs, should we pull back in our general insurance and put more into cybersecurity? It seems like this is more of a pressing issue than ever before. What do you say, Kyle? Well, so I think that this is a risk management decision. So this is not something that I can tell anybody what to do. So we need to look at um, what are the risks from general liability, or from the cyber side that are the most impactful for our business and has the business the biggest impact if something should go wrong. I would also discuss this with your insurance broker because there may be different business practices that we could implement or change how we do certain things that may reduce our pre premiums from a general business liability. And certainly from a cybersecurity insurance side of things, maybe there's practices that we can do to reduce what our premiums would be. So I would probably try, I would recommend doing a consultative approach, going back to your broker saying, I, what can I do to keep the same level of protection, but are there certain practices that make me more risky there, therefore increases my premium? So I would, I would engage in a dialogue with where I'm getting my insurance from. Yeah, that's, that's great feedback. And I've been with a lot of clients over the years that have actually have to increase their own general insurance. So I don't see it as a benefit to decrease really any insurance that to me, like makes my heart palpitate a little bit, but you're right. I think having that uh, consultation, really learning uh, the risk 
for that, you know, we certainly want to manage those risks. And you've been so great throughout this week, Kyle, to really, you know, provide these messages of hope and to say it's all about managing risk. And Evan, I think this answer that you just received from Kyle really provides that feedback to you, you know, to go to your insurance providers, plural, and ask them that question. I think, um, I think that's spot on. So thank you. And I hope that 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 helps Evan. It's, it's not going to help you cut corners, but hopefully it'll help keep your doors open. (laughs) That's what we want to do for sure. Okay. uh, Jamie in my neck of the woods here, Scottsdale, Arizona. Hello. How often do you recommend training of the staff in terms of understanding how critical cybersecurity really is? I think our staff um, think that this is only for uh, for for-profit companies and that for-profit companies are liable for attacks as opposed to nonprofits. Um, It sounds to me that nonprofits are just as vulnerable. What would you tell Jamie? So when we think about cybersecurity, training, most often the topic comes up around uh, phishing and awareness training, uh, doing those simulated phishing uh, attempts and measuring who clicks, who provides information, those types of things. And I don't know that it's worth staking everything on those, but they are a low cost way to be able to provide awareness within our companies. So the approach that we've seen across our company base is typically a quarterly approach to doing that sort of phishing and awareness training. Um, But it needs to be not in a punitive way. It needs to be in a learning sort of way. So how can we help people understand what those things are to understand um, if someone is trying to uh, spoof or pretend to be someone, what types of business processes needs to change in order to understand if if you can't trust the person that you have normally been interacting with, that they have control of their email anymore. Um, If someone's requesting address changes or requesting bank payment terms or different financial institution changes, what kind of business processes are we going to put in place and and provide that training to our people to make sure that we're paying people appropriately and we're not on the hook for uh, financial fraud through through business email compromise, those types of things. I'm curious, um, earlier this week, Kyle, you had mentioned about working Um, and I forget exactly with whom, but it was about doing a table test, table topic test. Can you, can you dive into that a little deeper? Yeah. So tabletop tests are, uh, just sitting around, uh, the table, uh, virtually or physically with those key people in your business or those key vendors that you rely upon to provide your technical stuff that you keep your business up and running with and making sure that we're talking through what would happen if disaster happened to us from an information technology perspective. And this could be from a lost availability of a system or from a cyber attack, um, whether it's business email compromise, ransomware, data theft, um, manipulation of our systems, something like that, understanding okay, do we have a plan? And if not, let's make a plan. And then once we have the plan, let's all get together and talk through the plan as it would relate to a specific incident to understand if we need to improve or uh, otherwise modify the plan. Have we thought of everything? What would be impacted? And this needs to be comprehensive too. So it's not just about technology because technology without business processes, without those things that we do to serve who we need to serve, technology doesn't matter. So it's all about what are those key activities that we need to do to support our business and to support who we need to support? And can we continue with those if we have an outage or if we have a disaster and and putting that front in front of mind? But yeah, that's great. And I and I think too, one of the things that really hit home for me that you had shared, and I want to say uh, on Monday, so again, that was when we were in person, had the great pleasure of launching the Nonprofit Power Week with you and I, Bailey, on Monday, was the average cost of a cybersecurity attack was approximately quarter of a million. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? You are remembering that correctly. Okay. And that's a really scary and painful number for people to have to go through. 
Yeah. So I think, you know, I know we're all super busy and maybe to think of, of doing a quarterly education for our staff, you know, it's really talking about that quantifiable impact that could could really be here knocking at our door. And I think sitting around and doing that table um, top test, that's talk about alliteration, a tabletop yeah. test, say that seven times fast. Um, you can't afford not to do that. And so I really think that that's a great best practice, Jamie, and, and you know what Kyle has shared here, some really good insight. And again, this entire week has been uh, chock full of information um, that, that Kyle has been able to provide for us. So hopefully that'll help to educate your staff, your volunteers, your board, and everyone involved with your organization. So excellent. All right, Kyle, you're a pro at this. So we've got question number three coming in from Houston, Texas. Uh, Brad wants to know, is older technology such as laptops and phones more apt to be less secure? We have some old technology and I am wondering if the issue of cybersecurity might make it more important to update some of our computer tech. Before you answer this, Kyle, I just wanna say, Brad, you're not alone. I think a lot of nonprofits around our country has a lot of old technology. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's let's hear what you have to say to Brad, Kyle. Sounds good. Well, so when I think about upgrades, um, it's not just about cybersecurity, right? So we want to make sure that uh, is the equipment that we're using still reliable? And am I still able to be productive on it? Is it fast enough to do what I needed to do in order to serve our customers? Um, along with that, then we start getting into, should I upgrade it just for cyber or the security side of things? And so for that answer, I would lean on to what kind of software are you running on that hardware, that, those devices? So for computers, traditional laptops, desktops, those types of things, most of everything we see in a non-profit space is on a Microsoft Windows type platform. It just, it is what it is. And so if we're still running things like Windows 7 or previous versions of Microsoft Windows, they're no longer getting security updates. That's, uh, if our hardware doesn't support upgrading to the newest operating systems, that's a good sign that we need to upgrade. Just because you're on Windows 10 now, or Windows 11 doesn't mean that you're on the current version of Windows 10 or Windows 11. So with the newest operating systems, they have moved to a periodic version refresh within that ecosystem. So Windows 10 has periodic feature pack upgrades that come out. And these aren't just patches, these are actually new versions of the operating system. And when these come out, only so many of the older versions are still supported and are still going to get those security patches, get those security updates. So it's important to ask those questions, even though I'm on the what I think is a, a newer operating system, am I still getting those updates being delivered to me? And, and so there's, there's a little bit more to keep in mind other than just is the hardware new enough to support the, the new stuff? You just blew my mind because I'm always of the thought that it, everything technology wise is plug and play, right? I, I use a um, an iPhone. I wish mm -hmm. that we had Apple as a sponsor. We don't yet. We're, we're going to work on that. But every time that there's an update, you know, or a new software installation, whatever, I don't speak this language. It tells me that it's going to happen, you know, at night yep. once it's plugged in. So my assumption, and we know why we spell assume, right, is... I, I mean, is that not for every computer? Are you telling me like we there's extra steps we need to take? So most computers do have that automatic update mechanism for their operating system, like iOS on your iPhone or on your okay. iPad. Yes. That doesn't mean that it works every time. So we need to check on it periodically to see <laughs> if that process has broken for some reason and recruit the proper help to troubleshoot it if it gets stuck for, for lack of a better word. And so that can happen with your iPhone, that can happen with your iPad, with your Android device, with your Windows device. It's something that it needs to be checked on periodically. So uh, monthly, quarterly, whatever fits your tolerance for risk. Again, we need to be checking in on that. Just, hey, do I have anything hanging out there? Did, did it actually work the way I expected it to? Because 
trust but verify. We we assume, again, assume that everything is going to be fine, but we need to trust but verify and understand um, it, are things actually working the way that we expected them to. And then speaking to the mobile devices, like what you brought up, uh, we want to stay on hardware that supports the latest version of iOS or the Android operating system. We don't want to be on hard drive, hardware just because we had it for the last five years that can't support the newest stuff. The newest stuff is what's solving those security vulnerabilities and making sure that you're not going to be an easy target uh, to be taking advantage of. Wow, Brad, I hope that you heard all that Kyle had to say. <laughs> I feel like my to-do list just got a little bit longer, but when it comes to risk tolerance, I don't think it's something that we can, as another uh, guest asked, cut corners. So uh, Brad, that's that's your feedback and response from Kyle. I think it's great. Again, I'm still learning and uh, so grateful to have have your nerdiness in this space, Kyle. <laughs> Okay, uh, Patrice in New York, New York, uh, sent in this question and wants to know, in regard to cybersecurity insurance, how much do you think annual coverage costs are going to increase or change? It seems that this is an escalating problem and that the costs are going to go through the roof. So I think that this is a very big message of hope. Uh, for everyone. Okay. I think that we, and so this is this is my opinion, I think that we are in a situation right now where they've increased dramatically where they're going to increase dramatically. I think that we're in a situation where there's only going to be incremental um, cost of, of living type increases to this type of service going forward. But what I do see as increased requirements for getting that so again, we went on insurance day, we talked about those five key controls that need to be implemented in order to get your, your policy renewed or get that policy in place in the first place. Um, as the malicious actors evolve and as they change tactics, that list of things that we're gonna be required to do is gonna change to reflect what's going on now. And so that's something we need to keep in mind. And that's where I'd recommend uh, setting up some sort of cadence with our cybersecurity insurance broker and making sure that has things changed? Do I need to be doing other things? How do I reduce risk so that I can make sure that I continue to get my policy? Um, or if there's any opportunities to implement certain things that allow me to reduce my premiums. and by implementing these things, that's not always just going out and buying something. Sometimes that's taking advantage of security settings or configuration on things that I already have. So this isn't necessarily outlaying a ton of money. Maybe it's just changing how I'm managing technology within the organization. And again, uh, refresh my memory. And for those of you that are viewing and listening, Kyle, you had mentioned that we could go to our cybersecurity insurance provider, ask them how they might be changing their requirements and uh, for us. And you were saying maybe do that, what, six months in advance not, or three months in advance? Could you? So, so I would say I would start off with six months in advance, but I would also preface that with, with your broker or with your agent saying, is this too soon? So just okay. making sure that you're working with the system that they have in place, but asking early is, is encouraged. I would definitely do that. And they're gonna have access to what the latest requirements are from the insurance carriers, knowing that you can get a head start on that. And again, working with them to see if you can reduce your premiums by doing things a little bit different. That's, yeah, I think that is the cherry on top, you know, really work with the partners that help you um, provide this insurance, the coverage, and, and to mitigate the risk, really working with them, because I think often we see that it's ours, we have to handle it, we need to figure out what it is. But one thing that I've certainly learned from you throughout this entire uh, week, the Nonprofit Power Week, is really to work with your partners, including I Bailey, on what needs to take place so that we can mitigate these risks. So I love that you uh, have this message of hope for Patrice and for all of us is that, you know, maybe we've already hit that that max of where these charges are really going to land and that 
they're not going to increase. Let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I think that's from everything I see. I think that's right where yeah. where it's going to be. Um, I've been wrong before, and and I'm okay with being teased for being wrong. But that's just that's just where my head is at. That's what you're seeing. And, and that's really important. Uh, so Patrice, again, and, you know, hopefully that helps. And I, I'm curious, I'm going to tag on to that question for her. Is it based off a geographic location? Because I noticed, you know, she's uh, asking from New York, I'm in Arizona, you're in North Dakota. Do you see that rate change across the nation? Um, so that rate probably changes for general liability based on okay. other factors, but from a cybersecurity insurance side of things, I don't, as long as you're in the United States, um, I'm, I'm, as far as I know, that, that rate is going to be consistent. Okay, that's, that's good it's to It's going to be more about how, how you protect the data and what that data is. So yeah. what, what kind of risk does the carrier have by insuring you? Got it. That's that's great insight. I have been amazed. I have been schooled. I have learned so much from you, Kyle Hendrickson, Director, Cybersecurity at Ide Bailey. You haven't been with Ide Bailey long, but you have been in the industry for a long time. Plus, you have started a nonprofit. So you really are a whiz when it comes to all things uh, NPO-related nonprofit organization for cybersecurity. Kyle, as we wrap up today's episode, you know, again, one of the things that Julie and I like to ask our guests, and it's a little bit of a curveball, but um, we assume, again, using that word, everyone has a crystal ball, right? So I want you to get your crystal ball out, shine it up. What are you seeing in the near future truly for, we're going to stick to nonprofits in the cybersecurity risk management space? Is there any kind of final, you know, foreshadowing you can provide us here? Um, ransomware is not going away. It's here to stay. Um, it's going to change forms. We see a lot of ransomware actors uh, pivoting to just stealing data and just moving right to the extortion phase, um, skipping over the encrypting and locking you out of your systems. Um, I think that's important to keep in mind as we are protecting very sensitive information. There's a lot of donors, a lot of people that are keeping us afloat as a business that don't necessarily want their name out there or their personal details out there. Um, we also, uh, in the nonprofit space, we have a lot of people that come from uh, environments where they need help and they don't necessarily want their contact information out there, regardless of the services that we're able to help them with or, or provide them. Um, so, Data protection, uh, when we start thinking about security uh, controls, we need to think about business outcomes. What is this gonna do for me and how is this gonna re reduce my risk? I don't wanna just buy something for the sake of buying it. I don't wanna check the box just to check the box for compliance. I wanna actually get value out of what I'm doing. And so I, I think there's gonna be more of a focus in on business outcomes as we talk about cybersecurity. What does it mean to the business by doing this? along with um, a continued focus on ransomware, at least for the next 24 months, the next two years, um, it's going to be a big thing and it, it, it's affecting all of us. Yeah, it is. And, and again, as technology advances, that's one thing we've certainly seen the acceleration of over the last three years for good or for bad. Who knows, mm -hmm. right? We can stay agnostic there. Um, but I, I love what you've shared each and every day this week. Um, again, for those of you that um, are just joining us today, or maybe you're only able to join us a couple of days this week, Kyle was with us each and every day this uh, nonprofit Power Week. As you see, Julie and I have not been here every day, but Kyle has. He has stuck with us. We absolutely adore um, everything that he has come on to share and really just, you know, again, I'm going to say it live and I, it's going to be recorded, but, you know, we never know who we're going to get when we're talking to someone in the technology sphere. Um, my my eyes tend to, to glaze over and I'm like, I'm not quite sure what this person just said. It's all Greek to me, but you have made it so relatable, so very easy to digest. 
I just really appreciate that. I appreciate all that you've shared with us every day this week. Again, if you missed any of the episodes here with Kyle, you can go back and watch, listen, share. You can do all of those good things. And uh, just so grateful to, to have your expertise. We also want to say thank you to our sponsors that keep the nonprofit show growing. We are marching towards 700 episodes. So we, we keep moving forward. So we want to say thank you also to our presenting sponsors that include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. Hey, I had mentioned, you know, if you missed any of the nonprofit shows, you missed any of the episodes this week with Kyle as we jumped and dove deep into cybersecurity, they're still there for your viewing pleasure. So YouTube, Vimeo, Amazon Fire TV, um, check them out. They're they're here. They're not going to go anywhere. They're going to stay online. And again, Kyle, we're going to miss you next week, but we wish you the best with pouring your concrete so you can prepare for your Thanksgiving. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Um, it's going to be weird without you next week. I know, but you know, I have a feeling we're going to have you back on. Ide Bailey is a great partner of ours and I'm so grateful to have a nonprofit power week dedicated to cybersecurity. We don't do power weeks very often. We really uh, save those and secure those for some hot topics like this one today. So again, I'm going to give another shout out. Kyle is on LinkedIn. He's active on LinkedIn. If you'd like to connect directly with Kyle, Find him, Kyle Hendrickson, Director of Cybersecurity for Ide Bailey. And of course, check out Ide Bailey. They are in, around, throughout our nation, uh, based in North Dakota, right there with Kyle. But again, they have offices and uh, individuals working in this sector all around the country. So Kyle, thank you. All of you that joined us, thank you. This is another Friday Ask and Answer and a wrap up for the Nonprofit Power Week. Hey, I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend, including you and your wife, Kyle. Again, you've got some, some heavy lifting this weekend, but I hope that everyone stays well so you can do well. Get some rest. We'll see you back here on Monday.